Uh, welcome back to our study in Ezekiel. Uh, we're in chapter 38. Uh, hopefully you got your copy of the scriptures out. Uh, and hopefully you've read chapters 38 and 39. We'll read them together. Uh, but it would do well for you to have that uh, kind of in the backdrop uh, so that you can kind of see the big picture of what we're dealing with. Uh, if you missed last week's study, I'd encourage you to, to go back and check that out. Uh, we dealt with uh, the Valley of Dry Bones, uh, which is uh, an often uh, looked at section in the book of Ezekiel uh, and, and looked at its meaning in the context of the book about how God is able to raise up uh, a dead nation, a dead people, uh, and give them life and, and, and breathe his spirit into them. Uh, so really a, a cool section. Uh, and so we're in chapter 38 and 39. And the whole this whole section, both of these chapters, is about the defeat of Gog. Uh, and uh, Gog is a, uh, a nation that we don't really have any historical record of. Uh, that's either for one of two reasons. Either because there was no nation of Gog. Uh, and God is using this as a, a term for a, a, a people group that is kind of uh, ambiguous and unnamed as just the enemies of God. Uh, and it could be anywhere. And he's going to name several other nations that are real people. Uh, and so maybe Gog is just uh, kind of the idea of all of these nations combined coming against God's people. Or it might turn out that uh, archaeology will one day dig up. Uh, that one of these nations was referred to as Gog, or there was uh, this this people group known as Gog that threatened uh, the nation of Israel. Who knows? Uh, what we do know is that John is going to later use this same terminology and imagery uh, referring to Gog as the enemy of God's people. And we'll, we'll reference that in Revelation chapter 20 uh, as we go along here. Uh, so, uh, we're in Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, 38 and 39 deal with uh, seven oracles against Gog. And so it's really the, uh, these, these seven sections are dealing with Gog uh, uh, raising up his armies against God's people and then God's response to that. Chapter 38, we'll kind of see the story play out. Chapter 39, we'll backtrack a little bit and see it play out in a little bit more detail. Uh, so probably not a, a lengthy study today. Uh, it might be a little bit shorter than usual, uh, but these two chapters definitely go together. Uh, and then when we get to uh, chapter 40, things are going to change dramatically uh, so that we probably need to keep those chapters uh, separate altogether. All right, so uh, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 38, 1 through 9. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog, the land uh, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Mekesh, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Mekesh, and Tubal, and I will turn you about, and I will put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your armies, horses and horsemen of them, splendid in splendidly attired. And great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, and with all his truth, troops, Beth to Morga, to, to Togamar, uh, from the remote parts of the north, with all its troops, many peoples with you. Uh, be prepared and prepare yourselves, you and your companies that are assembled about you, and be on guard for them. After many days you will be summoned, in the latter years you will come into the land and will be restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountain of Israel, which has been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. And you will go up, you will come like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. All right, so here we have a description of Gog uh, and his forces. Uh, Gog is listed here as the, the king of the land of Magog. All right, and uh, then and, and he's the, the prince of Rosh, Mekesh, and Tubal. Right, and so he, he, he's portrayed as this ruler over uh, several people groups. Uh, and these are uh, a lot of these people groups we'll end up seeing together, like are definitely enemies of God's people and have warred with them through the years. Uh, but here, uh, Gog is a, a prince, uh, and he is the uh, the ruler of 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 Rosh. All right, so uh, 
<clears throat> the terminology here uh, is very similar to what we saw in chapter 29, uh, where there was this, this great sea monster that was Babylon, that was portrayed as a sea monster. A lot of similar terminology uh, that we saw there about it, its greatness. Uh, and God uh, here is, is not necessarily defending his people. He's not going to fight for his people. Here you have uh, Gog coming uh, about uh, and, and placing uh, hooks uh, in the jaws. And he says, I will bring you out all of your armies, horses and horsemen, uh, in verse 4. Uh, and so God is bringing all of these armies out. Uh, he's not fighting them. He's bringing them out. Uh, and all of these nations are going to join themselves together against God. Uh, and so uh, God is saying, go ahead, bring yourself out. Bring your, As a matter of fact, God will lead them out, the, the imagery is. Uh, and Israel has been restored. It's a people group. And what we're going to see is that God is declaring his uh, ability to defend his people. And this is going to be a little bit different historically because he chose not to defend his people against Babylon. But now he's, he's not uh, defending them yet. All the people are going to come out and God is going to deal with them uh, at once. All right. Uh, so uh, verse 9, we get to see kind of the vastness of his army. It's like a cloud that covers the land. Uh, and so there's this greatness about it. So let's look at verses 10 through 13. He says, Thus says the Lord God, It will come about on that day uh, that thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against the land of, of unwalled villages. I will get, go against those who are at rest, that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates, to capture spoil and to seize plunder to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods and live at the center of the world, Sheba and Dedan and the mountains of Tarshish. With all its villages, you will say, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture great spoil? All right, so here we see uh, Gog's plan, and it's really to attack defenseless people, those who live in unwalled cities, and we see Gog's brutality uh, and, and really his, his, his just lack of compassion, his lack of morality, his lack of, uh, of, of righteousness and justice as he just attacks uh, defenseless people. And the idea is that, that God has, has restored his people, because right? this is looking like future af after the restoration of Israel. And God is going to restore his people, but they're going to be restored to Jerusalem, which is now a defenseless city. And really, it's not going to be until later on under the Persian rule uh, that when the people come back and they're able to actually rebuild uh, uh, Jerusalem and Nehemiah is able to come back uh, later years and actually rebuild the wall, uh, that the people are going to come back and it's, it's going to be kind of defenseless and they're going to rely completely on God uh, as their defense. Uh, and so this is what God is planning on doing with uh, his enemies. And, and likely, uh, at least my conclusion on, on this whole, this, these two sections, is Gog is the residual of Babylon. That, that uh, God is going to defeat Babylon, who would continue to, to plunder his people after the captivity. You know, they, or at least not plunder, but be a threat to his people after the captivity. Uh, and God is going to put an end to all of that so that his people can come out of captivity and live freely uh, through the reign of the Persians uh, and the Greek. Although they'll still be under those nations, uh, they won't be in captivity like they are currently. All right, so uh, we definitely see uh, Gog has, is not uh, concerned about uh, you know, killing innocent people. All right, verses 14 down through 16, we have our third oracle. Uh, and we see Gog's army uh, kind of being mobilized here. So, verse 14. Therefore, prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel are living securely, will you not know it? And you will come from your place out of the remotest parts of the north, and the many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, and a great assembly, a mighty army, and you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land, in order that the nations may go against, or the, the nations may know me, 
when I shall be sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. All right, so here we have uh, God is bringing Gog out. So you have to keep those two. <laughs> God is bringing Gog out. Uh, and did Gog know about the Israelites? Uh, yes, he knew, but did he know that they were defenseless and living there uh, e easily to be taken? No, it seems like God actually showed him uh, this, this nation. And so Gog, God is drawing him out. Uh, and this is all going to show that it's God who is going to fight for his people. His people are defenseless, and it's God who will protect them, that his victory will be credited to him, and it will be his righteousness so that people will know that he is the Lord, because he alone uh, is their God, and no longer are they going to turn to idols. All right, so uh, he's going to be sanctified in verse 15 or verse 16. That's his that's what that phrase like the nations may know that when I shall be sanctified through you, like God is going to be set apart as a holy and awesome God, and he's going to prove it through the defeat of Gog. All right, so uh, let's look at this uh, defeat uh, starting in 17, uh, and we'll read down through uh, the end of the chapter here. Thus says the Lord God. Are you the one who I speak in the former days through my servant, the prophet Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? And, and it will come about on that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger and my zeal and in blazing wrath. I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in all the land of Israel, and the fish in the sea, and the birds of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake in my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. And I shall call for the sword against him on my mountain, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and with pestilence and with blood I shall enter into judgment on him, and I shall rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. All right, so here we have Gog has been assembled. He's brought out his armies. They're like the clouds, like they cover the earth. There's this massive army. Uh, and then God brings his wrath upon them. And he, and he does it in, in a couple different ways. But at the, at the end of it, in verse 22, he rains fire from heaven down on them, completely defeating Gog uh, and declaring God himself as the clear victor so that he is sanctified. And that's like our key idea uh, among these two chapters is that God is sanctifying himself. No longer is he the God that just allowed Babylon to come and conquer his people. He's the God that's defending his people. He's, he's set apart in a holy way that all the surrounding nations would know that the God of Israel lives and is at work. Uh, so this whole thing is really reminiscent of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, let's, let's flip over there, uh, Revelation chapter 20. We'll be right back here in Ezekiel, uh, but just so you're uh, looking at this. So Revelation 20 is this uh, chapter that's dealing with the end times. It's dealing with what's going to happen when, when God uh, sends Jesus. Uh, he returns uh, to, to redeem the lost, the resurrection, the final judgment, all of that. Uh, that's kind of this timeline in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, and so verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, and thousand years uh, are this time when, when God is going to come, or when Jesus is going to come back. So when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So look at the, the, the battle that happens in Revelation chapter 20. Look at how it's described. First off, guess who's front player? Gog. 
Now, in Revelation 20, it's described, instead of Gog, who's from the land of Magog, Magog is portrayed as another person, or at least a people group. And so Gog and Magog are gathering themselves together, and they, they recruit from all over the world, and they pull their army together, and John describes it as though they are more numerous, or their, their number is like the sand of the seashore. Ezekiel describes it as like a cloud covering the earth. Right, so you get the same idea, like here's this massive army. And what has this massive army done in verse 9? They've come up to the people of God. And they surround the city as though there's no hope. Everything is, is doomed for the people of God. They're surrounded by this innumerable army. And all they have is this one little city that's surely going to fall. And when it looks completely hopeless, God rains down fire from heaven and devours them. And in the most in the most unclimactic or, or anticlimactic way, God defeats the greatest threat ever brought against him and his people. And it's as if for God it's not even a problem. As if God could just from rem a remote location just pour down, you know, fire and brimstone on these and and it's over. He doesn't even have to make an appearance. He doesn't have to come. There's no battle. There's no fight. There's no tension. There's no, you know, there, all of that plot, it just dissolves immediately as God just rains down fire. And that, that is an awesome sight because you look at Israel while they're in captivity. And man, it just seems like Babylon is an, a force that, you know, who could ever defeat Babylon? Who could ever bring an end to this, the reign uh, of these men? Right? You move all the way up into the Christian era and you're thinking, who could, who could ever defeat evil? Like, how is this, gonna, how is this all going to end? And God can defeat Babylon and God can defeat evil throughout all of the world. And so when, when Gog and Magog or when Satan gathers all his forces together, it's still, it's nothing. It's just a, a simple raining of fire for God to defeat Satan. I think the most powerful part of that story is that God is victorious, and he doesn't even have to try. It's not even going to be hard for God to vanquish evil in the final day, to defeat Satan and all who have joined themselves against uh, God and his people. It's really going to be quite simple for God to be victorious. No, no problem at all. And that's the message, I think, of Revelation 20, that God is absolutely victorious, and he doesn't really even have to try. He's that powerful. He's that awesome. And that, so a lot of that same terminology coming out in Ezekiel chapter 39. We're seeing, you know, Gog and, and the forces and how quickly the battle is ended because God rains down fire. Man, very similar imagery to Revelation chapter 20. John in Revelation draws all of that in to talk about the final judgment. Now, if you're a Jew, man, this... The, the, the defeat of Babylon, it may as well be the, the final judgment. Like how amazing and powerful would that be to see a nation like Babylon fall to its knees? Uh, and so maybe, maybe Ezekiel is, is kind of, you know, planting some seeds of end time thoughts just as well. Could be because John's going to pull on those for sure. Uh, but don't let that be the only understanding. This has to mean something to who Ezekiel is speaking to. It's got to be a message of hope for them. And I think the message is the same. God is awesome, and he can handle your problems. He can handle you know, the, the, the relationship problems you have. He can handle the job problems you have. He can handle a world and nation that is oppressing you. He can handle Satan and all the evil in the world. He can handle these problems, and it's not challenging or difficult for him. Chapter 40, or chapter 39, excuse me. Uh, we're going to, uh, in kind of a, a classic Hebrew style, uh, is to tell a story and then to go back into the story and kind of explore a section of it with a lot more detail. Uh, one of the, the classic illustrations is Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2, you have, uh, so Genesis 1, boom, six days, God makes everything. Like on the sixth day, he makes uh, Adam, right? Seventh day, he rests. Moving to chapter two, 
it's like we go back into chapter one and we start the story of the creation of man all over again, but we explode it and we look at it in so much more detail and we add Eve into the mix. And there's all kinds of things going on uh, that weren't mentioned in chapter one because chapter one was an overview. Chapter two is this exploded version of this section. So we see that a lot uh, in Hebrew literature. Uh, so that's what's happening in chapter 39. Uh, we're going back into the story and we're going to uh, look at it a little bit deeper about this the battle and how victorious God is. All right, so chapter 39, let's read 1 through 16. You, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Mekesh, and Tubal, and I shall turn you around, drive on you, and take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I shall strike your bow from your left hand, and dash down your arrows from your right hand. And I shall, you shall fall on the mountain of Israel, you and all your troops, and the people who are with you. I shall give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall in the open field. For it is as I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I shall send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am the Lord. And my name, or my holy name, I shall make known in the midst of my people Israel. And I shall not let my holy name be profaned any more. The nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it shall be done, declares the Lord God, that it is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires and the weapons, uh, fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers and bows and arrows, war clubs and spears. For seven years they will make fires with them. And they will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with the weapons that they shall take as spoil from those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. And it will come about on that day that I shall give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off passerbys so that they will, uh, so they will bury Gog there with all his multitude. And they will call it the valley of Hammon Gog. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them, and it will be to their uh, and it will be to their renown on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. And they will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those uh, who were passing through even those left on the surface of the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. And those who pass through the land, pass through, and anyone who sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And even the name of the city will be Hamana, for they will, be, for they will cleanse the land." All right, so you look at the vastness of the army. Remember, it was covering, it was like a cloud covering the earth, like this huge army that comes up against God's people. God vanquishes and just destroys the army with uh, fire from heaven, rains down fire and brimstone. Uh, and so what's left but a whole bunch of dead soldiers uh, with a bunch of uh, armor and weapons. And so as God is just describing how vast the army is and how great his victory is, uh, he does a couple things. First, he declares uh, his holiness. So look at verse 7. Here we have this idea again. He says, my holy name I will make known. Right? And then he says it again in halfway through 7. I shall not let my holy name be profaned anymore. Right? So back in chapter 38, he was talking about how he was going to sanctify himself. Well, the words sanctify and holy are the same thing. Right? They come from the same word. Well, it's like an adjective versus a verb versus a noun. Right? But to sanctify something is to make it holy. It's the same thing. And so God is talking about how holy his name is, how sanctified he is. And he's not going to be profaned anymore because the foreign nations and even his own people were saying, you know, where is God? Who is this God that you serve that, that can't defend you from the Babylonians? 
And God says, now's the time. I'm, I'm bringing it in my time. He didn't feed Babel, defeat Babylon when it was convenient for Israel. He's going to defeat Babylon in his timeline after the captivity and everything that he, he needed to accomplish took place. And so maybe just a, a little micro lesson in there that God works on, a, on his own timeline and he has things planned out that could be, you know, 50, 100 years, 70 years in the making. And we are living and dying in, inside of this plan of God. And everything that we expect God to be and want him to be for us and for this world, maybe we're not going to see that today or tomorrow, even in our lifetime. Maybe God has a plan that includes a captivity, that includes a restoration, that's going to span lifetimes of people. That's how big God is working. Not necessarily within, we want something next week. Uh, so remember that when you're praying about God's timeline versus our timeline and what God is trying to accomplish in the world and what we want him to accomplish in the world. And sometimes those are, are quite different. So uh, we see the vastness of the army because uh, the, the, the shields and the bows and the arrows that are picked up, uh, the Israelites use them as firewood for seven years uh, and they're burning them. And the vastness of the army are just sitting there to be buried. And so Israel has to come through uh, and bury the dead. And it takes them seven months to dig all of those holes. All right, and so uh, all, all of this hopefully is kind of pointed. The number seven should automatically kind of be, you start seeing the number seven repeated in Hebrew literature. And your brain should kind of switch over to, oh, maybe this is kind of figurative. Because seven is a pretty special number. Uh, in, in Hebrew literature, kind of like the number three, the number 10. There's, there's several different numbers uh, that, that mean things. And so when you start seeing the number seven, like there's seven oracles in 38 and 39, uh, these uh, seven years of firewood, these seven months of bearing, that like God is showing a, a fullness and a completeness of something because the number seven is a, a full, complete, mature number. Uh, so whatever it is, like we're, we're seeing God is fully taking care of something, uh, and it's, it's pretty awesome. All right, let's read uh, 17 down through 24. All right, as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and every beast of the field, assemble uh, and come gather them from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you. As a great sacrifice on the mountain of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes of the earth, as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are gluttoned, and drink blood until you are drunk, for from my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. And you will be glutton on the table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men, all men of war, declares the Lord God. And I shall set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will, set, will see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. And the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity, because they acted treacherously against me, and I hid my face from them, so I have so I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword according to the uncleanness, and according to their transgressions I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. All right, so God is making a sacrifice now, uh, and so this army is viewed as a sacrifice to the birds and the beasts of the field. That, that God is, is handing it over to them, and they can feast on the armies of Gog, which is, in, in my estimation, is, is Babylon, that God is going to fully conquer. Uh, and uh, all of this is to show that God is holy, and, those, and that, the, the, that people would know, uh, again, in verse 21, he's going to set his name, uh, as he's going to set my glory among the nations and then in verse 22 that the house of israel will know that i am the lord so those are our two key phrases that we're seeing in chapters 38 and 39 and god's going to do this by offering this army as a sacrifice and why why did all of this take place he reminds them that it was because of their unfaithfulness and their uncleanness their idolatry 
they got themselves there. And that's why when Babylon, you know, God brought Babylon, God hid his face. God hid. He did not defend his people, but he let Babylon take them into captivity for 70 years. But now all of that has changed, and God is ready to vindicate his name, and it will be counted as holy among the nations. All right, our seventh oracle starts in chapter, uh, in verse 25 of chapter 39. Uh, so let's read that. We'll pull all of this together uh, and we'll wrap it up. Verse 25, therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I shall restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. And I shall be jealous for my holy name and they shall forget their disgrace and all their treachery, which they perpetrated against me. And when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid, when I bring them back from the people and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. And they will know that I am the Lord their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations and gathered them again to their own land, and I will leave none of them there any longer." I will not hide my face against them any longer, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. All right, so we see that God's judgment against Israel was not permanent. He definitely took them into exile, uh, but his judgment was not permanent. Uh, and uh, he did not destroy them uh, permanently. He has every intention of bringing them back because he's jealous for his name in verse 25. So again, that idea that God is going to be declared as holy. And for a time, he put up with the four nations, slandering his name, and that he was not powerful enough to defend his people. Uh, but no longer is he going to put up with that. Uh, he wants his name to be holy. And so the end result is that God's people are going to live securely in this land, and God will be sanctified. So ultimately what you see is God bringing his people out of this captivity. Remember, they're in that captivity right now. They're, they're suffering through all of this. But this message that God is going to restore them, he's going to bring them out. And this oppressive nation that took them into captivity, God's going to take care of them. Right, how is he going to do that? Ultimately, it's going to be at the hand of the Persians. Right, they are going to come and conquer uh, the Babylonians. And it's under the hand of the Persians that the nation of Israel is finally going to be released from captivity and be able to come and, and be restored as a people. Uh, so all of these things are going to take place in history down the road. And this is the promise that God is, God is back. He is coming back to defend his people, but not yet. Uh, there's this time of captivity that they have to go through first. So a, a really cool uh, two, two chapters uh, about God coming uh, to redefend his people. The next section is chapters 40 through 46. All right? Those seven chapters we're going to cover as one piece. Now, if you read, and I would encourage you to read 40 through 46, but honestly, if you get you know two chapters through it and you're just kind of tired, I, I understand. It's a tough seven chapters. Uh, and so we're going to we're not going to read it next week. Uh, we're just going to kind of piece it together and see what's going on in those seven chapters. So it would, it would really do you well to read through it, but it's going to be a little bit tough. So give yourself some patience. Maybe, maybe break it up and read it in a couple different settings. Uh, it might be helpful for you. But it's all about like this, what, what God is going to do. Like we're still in this, this restoration. And, and from chapters 40 on is really about the restoration and what God's going to do. Uh, so uh, I would encourage you to read those uh, and uh, you'll be ready for next week. All right, well, let's pray. God, thank you for being awesome and being a uh, God that we know is victorious, whether you were victorious against uh, a huge nation like Babylon or whether you'll be victorious against uh, all of evil in the final day. God, we know that you are a God that is victorious and we're we're behind you. We're with you. And help us to not lose sight of that, to not get sidetracked with the world and its pursuits and in uh, its sense of victory. But help us to have faith in you, to trust in you, that your path is the right path, that you will be our victory. God, help us to trust you because life gets complicated and sometimes we get distracted and we get depressed, we get hurt, we get fearful. 
And God, remove all of that so that we just see you and that your willingness to fight for us. And we love you, God. We're so thankful for your forgiveness. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.